morning. Uh, my name is Thomas Modin, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce this session called How CT Fusion Can Empower Your Structural Heart Procedures. I'm based in Paris, but the studio is live from London, and it's my immense pleasure to uh, share this session with my colleagues. First of all, Julia Grapsa, echocardiographer from St. Thomas uh, Hospital, uh, Erwan Donal, he's a professor in cardiology from uh, Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Rennes in France, and of course, uh, my friend, Professor Rajani Ronak, he's a radiologist in St. Thomas, London, Great Britain. So the focus of the session is going to be how to use the fusion capacities in order to facilitate uh, mitral implant, mitral uh, treatments, percutaneous mitral treatments, having in mind that there are three key factors for success for mitral, but in the future also tricuspid. There is a human factor, which based on the skills of the doctors who are involved. There are also the iterations, which is the development and, and amelioration of the devices. And this is an interaction between cardiologists, doctors, and the uh, industry. But there is a very important factor that we underestimate, and we are here to discuss this and show it and share it together, which is imaging, imaging in all the aspects. So what we do directly, but also all what could facilitate the use and the interpretation of imaging. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the session with us. We're going to go uh, the presentations of uh, Professor Donal first, uh, and then we will uh, be happy to, to see also what Julia and, and uh, Ronak will be sharing with us. And then we will have plenty of time to many, many questions from your side, but also an internal discussion. Erwan, the word is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for providing me the opportunity to discuss today about the benefit of fusion imaging for the treatment of mitral valve diseases. It's a great pleasure for me to be with such a faculties and to discuss this topic. Of course, we all know that secondary mitral regurgitation remains a clinical issue. We know that it's frequent. We know that it's associated with the prognosis of many patients and we don't really know who are the perfect patients that should be treated by CLIP or by TMVR. What is known is that TMVR could be a solution for patients who are non-suitable for mitral CLIP. And then we have, when we try to implant a TMVR, to have correct images to make sure that the procedure will go smoothly and we reach to a perfect result. And for that, we use the CT and we use the echo. And the beauty is that today we can have a fusion between CT and echo. And as you can see on the slide, we can merge the information of echo and CT very easily using our echo platform and then we can visualize both images on the same visual perspective on the echo screen in the cat lab. We can also use uh, echo modalities that are quite interesting when we assess a patient before the implantation of the device but also during the implantation where when we are in the operating room and when we implant the TMVR. Here you have the FlexiLight, which is a visualization that is more photorealistic and it provides us a very clear vision of the cardiac structures like the mitral valve. Also, we have new echo modalities that are quite interesting to best see the colors. And you see that we can perfectly assess the jet of a mitral rigueur as well as the jet of the tricuspid rigueur using this new modality that is the HD color. This HD color is suitable for TTE and TEE and can be applied afterwards on softwares that we use for our reports. And now let me discuss a bit about a case of a tendine prosthesis that has been implanted in our center in Rennes. 
First of all, the patient. This is a lady, uh, 63 years old. She had a radiotherapy long time ago for Hodgkin lymphoma. She was hospitalized several times for acute heart failure, and she was optimized for the medical treatment, but remained in NIH 2B or 3. When we see her stable, as stable as possible, the anti pro is still 1,089 uh, picogram per millimeter. And when you look at the TTE, you see that the LV ejection fraction is 45, the LV and diastolic diameter is no more at 47 millimeter. The LA is enlarged with a 55 millimeter per meter square, and there is a severe restriction of mitral valve leaflet motion. And this restriction of mitral valve leaflet motion uh, is responsible of a regurgitant orifice area of 35 millimeters square. And this severe mitral regurgitation, this severe uh, restrictive mitral regurgitation uh, is associated with an increase in pulmonary pressure with a systolic pulmonary pressure estimated at uh, 55 millimeters square. And there is a preserved RV function with a RV strain of minus 22. This is quite interesting to see the first image, which is a 4D on-phase view of the mitral valve, and the second one, which is the 4D on-phase view of the mitral valve with the flexilite. You see also the 4D color with HD color and flexilite showing the location of the regurgitation. And the fourth image is quite interesting because it is the fusion between echo and CT. The CT as you know, is mandatory when we uh, assess a patient for the implantation of a TMVR. But when we do the um, CT, most of the time we do it several weeks before the implantation of the device. And the loading condition might be quite different when we assess the patient by CT and when we are in the operating room. So this is quite interesting and quite important to be able to um, check using the fusion between CT and ECHO that what has been planned on the CT that has been done before the implantation is still valid when we are in the operating room. We can check that the measurements that have been done before the implantation is still, are still valid when we are in the operating room thanks to the fusion between the CT that has been done a long time ago, and the echo that is done in the operating room. Here you see that we start the uh, implantation of the uh, Tendine TMVR prosthesis. And when we implant a Tendine, it requires an apical approach, which is applying up front on the CT, as I told you before. And in practice, we use a finger poke and this finger poke is performed at the apex, and the echo is, is used to visually confirm that the location matches with the puncture location that has been planned previously in the city, on the city. This is a crucial step, as it will influence the success of the procedure outcome. The overlay of the echo and the city on the city uh, provide an extended field of view of the anatomy, which may ensure that the finger pole location match with the transapical location that has been planned before. Once the puncture is performed, the delivery catheter is guided by echo through the mitral valve. And again, the CT fusion may help in the navigation and orientation of the catheter through the mitral valve. To deploy the device, the delivery catheter needs to be placed in the center of the mitral valve, and the tip of the catheter needs to be at least two centimeters above the annulus. This will ensure that the device doesn't open below the annulus, which would have severe consequences. The whole process is monitored through, uh, thanks to the 4D echoes. Once the device is deployed, both 4D and biplan images are used to check the correct location of the device. As you can see, on this specific case, it seems that the device was too high in the LA, 
and it was difficult to distinguish the mitral annulus due to the shadow and the artifacts generated by the device and the delivery catheter still in place. The overlay of ECHO on CT confirmed that the device was indeed a bit too high, that it was not totally settled on the analysis. The fusion provided enough confidence to allow the device to be repositioned and push a little bit more down to the valve. As you can see, it was very successful. And thanks to this fusion between CT and ECHO, we were able to push a bit the mitral prosthesis, and the final result showed in biplan, biplan color, 4D, 4D with flexilite and color, that the prosthesis was perfectly deployed. The position was perfect and there was no PVN. The fusion on echo on CT shows that the device is a bit low, that is uh, the lower that previously, and that is perfectly on the mitral annulus. The assessment of the neo LVOT is always a challenge when the device is implanted because we all again have the shadowing due to the prosthesis that prevents us to perfectly see the LVOT after the device implantation. But thanks to the fusion between ECHO and CT, we can confirm, as you can see on the slide, that the LVOT is preserved and that there is no obstruction of the LVOT after the implantation of the tendine prosthesis. Therefore, it's time for me to conclude, and I hope that you are convinced that now we have new prosthesis that can be implanted in patients who have a mitral rigor that is not suitable for mitral clip, and of course not suitable for conventional uh, surgical valve replacement. And pa patients can be referred they can be assessed very precisely by clinicians, by ECHO, by CT. And then we go to the operating room and we can use the CT that has been done previously. And the intervention was settled thanks to this CT and these ECHOs that has been done previously. But we can still use the CT that has been done previously during the implantation to make sure that we implant the device perfectly. So this is quite nice to see how cardiac ultrasound devices are now so suitable for the operating room and can be of such a help to implant prosthesis like the tendine one. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Julia Grabsa and I have no disclosures for the, this lecture. And uh, these are the disclosures of uh, my colleague, Professor Rona Karajani. And uh, we will move to the first case. Uh, so. We are describing a 70-year-old female patient, and she has a, a BMI of 29.5. She has good functional status, uh, she's independent, she's still driving, but uh, on, over the last 12 months, she describes progressive shortness of breath. She's now in New York Association class three. And also the symptoms are getting worse because uh, after the onset of persistent AF. Now from her prior my clinical history, she has in 2008, she had a mitral valve replacement with a 27 millimeters perimount bioprosthesis. In 2015, she suffered an anterior ST elevation MI with PCI to LAD. And in 2015, the same year, she had also an ICD inserted. Then in 2016, the lead got infected and she had the ICD replaced. And also in 2018, she had the breast carcinoma treated by mastectomy. On the next slide, we see that her hemoglobin was 108 uh, and creatinine was uh, on, on uh, upper limits of normal, but BNP was 2,956, so clearly uh, she's in heart failure. And she's on optimal medication on warfarin, furosemide, bisoprol, candesartan, clopidogrel, and atropastatin. Then uh, on the next slide, uh, on the transthoracic echo, the first things that we noticed is that she had a dilated LV for her size, of course, with uh, end diastolic diameter of 62 millimeters and severe systolic dysfunction, ejection fraction was calculated 15 to 20% with extensive akinesis of anterior and inferoceptal walls. Also, we noticed that there was severe uh, degeneration of the bioprosthesis with a mean gradient of almost 11 millimeters per mercury and with mild to moderate mitral regurgitation and a dilate left atrium. Also, the, the right ventricle was a problem because she had severe systolic dysfunction with the TAPSI only 
um, 0.6 centimeters, 6 millimeters, and mild to moderate tricuspid station and elevated pulmonary pressures. On the next slide now, we'll show you first the transthoracic echo on the top, the first two, two slides, the first two images, that you will see that the main problem here was the LV dilatation and poor LV and also the left atrial dilatation. And we already know that uh, fixing this valve um, from, a surgical, uh, from a surgical perspective is very high risk. Moreover, also, if we try percutaneously, it will, it will need careful consideration. Also, at the bottom, you will see the transesophageal echo that we performed pre-procedurally. And here uh, on the next slide is uh, that you will see with the help of, uh, first we did the 3D, and then we used the 4, 4D photorealistic flexilite, uh, which actually prepares the rendering technique and it uh, provides illumination of the heart structures. It provides us better depth and better illustration of all the structures so we can see that there is severe degeneration and stenosis of the bioprosthesis and actually the one disc is not moving at all. And then there is also mild to moderate mitral regurgitation. So here Flexilite is make, making our life easier practically because it provides a comprehensive visualization of the bioprosthesis. On the next slide, we actually discussed the patient in a heart team, an MDT, and we the Euro score was 19.8%, STS score 5.8% mortality, and as you can see, the patient was at high risk for reduced surgical MVR. Then uh, we decided that the procedure of choice would be transcatheter valve in valve if there was low risk of neo LVOT obstruction. So, Prof. Rajani will take now the CT analysis. Many thanks, Julia. So our standard approach at Guys and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust is to perform a multi-phase ECG-gated cardiac CT scan on all of our patients being considered for transcatheter mitral valve therapies. And this also includes valve-in-valve -valve, uh, mitral valve procedures. Now, the first thing we do is we measure around and segment the CT data set. And you can see that we've segmented the left ventricle, the left atrium, and also the aorta. Knowing the predetermined size of the 27 millimeter perimount, we're then able to virtually implant a valve of the specific type and size, which is going to be intended for the procedure. And we would use the valve and valve app for this purpose. Now, using the app, we determined that this patient would be suitable for either a 26 millimeter sapien or a 29 millimeter sapien. And the decision really comes down to what the interventional cardiologist will feel that the patient will get the best result. We generally implant the valve and look at various heights of deployment from the left atrium to the left ventricle using fixed ratios. My own personal preference is to use a deployment of 60% in the left atrium to 40% in the left ventricle, 50 to 50%, 40% in the left atrium to 60% in the left ventricle. And from this, we're able to derive the neo-left ventricular outflow tract area. The next step, which you can see on the slide at the moment, is also to plan the transeptal puncture. Now, one of the key fundamental factors that influences procedural outcome for the interventional cardiologist is making sure that they get a good transeptal puncture, which gives them an optimal approach down on to the degenerative bioprosthetic mitral valve. And this is dependent on the size of the left atrium, but also the angle of the crossing and making sure that the height of the crossing before you uh, navigate down towards a bioprosthetic mitral valve is optimal. We also use this technology to determine the optimal fluoroscopic projection angles so we can guide our interventional cardiologists at the time of their procedure. Now, over the years, we've also moved on from using standard CT processing packages, such as the materialized mimics and light platform, to start to think a little bit more about the tissue properties of the bioprosthetic mitral valve and also how they will deform. We work with our colleagues, FIOPS in Belgium, produce finite element modeling. Now, finite element modeling is something quite distinct to standard CT processing packages in terms of that it enables simulation of physical phenomena. In other words, it accounts for stresses and strains in the physical behavior of biological tissue and implanted structures. On the screen, you will see that we've implanted both a 26 and 29 millimeter sapien 3 valve into this patient's bioprosthetic mitral valve. Now, using finite element modeling, we're also able to predict what the valve will behave like. We've also now started to incorporate uh, virtual reality into a lot of our procedural planning. And the advantage of this for myself and also Julia 
is that it enables us to really transmit and to communicate with our interventional cardiologist colleagues all of the pre-procedural planning that has happened in advance. We're able to provide our interventional cardiologists a 3D headset where they're able to manipulate the CT data set themselves and to appreciate the overall anatomy. And you can see that we've actually burnt on this image the actual Sapien 3 implant in the bioprosthetic mitral valve. So before an interventional cardiologist now goes in for the procedure, they have all of the information to hand to help guide them for their procedure. That's very interesting, uh, uh, Ronak, and you're right that uh, this is the key actually for periprocedural planning. And uh, then we move to uh, the TOE intra the procedure. And here, as you correctly mentioned, that we had your guidance in order to calculate the transeptal puncture which uh, actually was uh, almost four centimeters from away from the mitral prosthesis. And of course, again, uh, the FlexiLite helped us in the three, 3D, and of course the X-Plane helped us actually orientate a little bit the catheter and uh, provide to the interventions the right approach for the trans transeptal puncture. Now, on the next slide, as you can see then, uh, the, our inter Professor Simon Redwood, and, uh, who was the interventionist here in this case, he moved uh, the guiding catheter across the mitral prosthesis again with the help of uh, photorealistic plexilite. And we, you can see uh, uh, again that the mitral prosthesis, the discs are not moving, of course, with the guiding catheter going into the valve, then things are becoming even worse at the point and everything should be done really fast. And uh, Another point, as we mentioned before, that the LV ejection fraction is very poor, so it doesn't help. And then uh, the first step is the balloon, that uh, they balloon for, and then they implant the new valve uh, across uh, valve in valve uh, inside the, the old bioprosthesis. So again, uh, we use the flex light here, and you can see this is the time of uh, the balloon and then uh, the valve implantation with a successful result on the next slide. And you can, we can see that the valve is opening quite nicely. And on the next slide, we assessed if there is any uh, paraprosthetic leak and there was no significant leak. So uh, a great result after a uh, great uh, periprocedural planning. And of course, with your help uh, with the CT and, uh, and the multimodality imaging. So thank you so much. Uh, the next slide now is uh, we are going to forward to the second case. And we will describe a 71-year-old man who has a previous background of 31 Carpentier Edwards pericardial prosthesis uh, for secondary mitral regurgitation in 2002. So it's a good 19-year-old valve. And then in 2016, he had CRTD implantation, and he's known to have moderate to severe biventricular impairment. Also, he has a background of COPD, rheumatoid arthritis, and intermittent claudication. And uh, then uh, uh, you can see that his FEV1, 1.5, which is quite low, actually it's pro prohibiting cardiac surgery. And uh, he's coming in New York Translation Class 3, and he describes PND. And he exercises only 50 yards and he gets out of breath. He has an early diastolic murmur. And uh, on the transthoracic echo, on the next slide, uh, you can see that while we understand that it is a, a degeneracy, we have significant degeneration again of the mitral prosthesis and biventricular impairment, as we mentioned, we need to, we struggle to understand the exact mechanism of this uh, mitral prosthesis, you know, of, of this stenosis. So, and then on the next slide, we see from the four apical chamber view that we have a, a significant degree of mitral stenosis and also a degree of mitral regurgitation. So as I said, we have a 19-year-old uh, valve that there is a significant degeneration, but in order to clarify the mechanism, we now use multimodality imaging and your help, Ronak. So please, uh, what, what did you think with the CT and, and uh, the rest of the imaging? Yeah, so th thanks very much, Julia. This really was a fascinating case, and I recall us both discussing uh, the echocardiogram and also the CT findings. So this is the raw axial CT data set, and as we're scrolling down through the data set, we can see that there's no significant obstructive coronary artery disease, and we can also see that this patient has a CRTD in situ with a pacing lead to the right ventricle, the right atrium, and also the obtuse marginal vein. 
Now, the first step when we're planning for transcatheter mitral valve procedures is that we use multiplanar reformatted imaging. And what you can see here now is that I'm placing my crosshairs over the base of the uh, bioprosthetic mitral valve so we can start to appreciate what the size of the sewing ring is. Often we need to change our window width and level so we can get a good appreciation of the anatomy. And I'm now scrolling down from the left atrium through to the left ventricle. Now on the bottom right hemorrhage, you'll start to see that there is this focal area of thickening at the commissures between the septal and also the anterior leaflets. I've now placed my crosshairs over this uh, echo dense area and I'm now going to rotate my crosshairs along the plane. Now, what we actually visualize is that in actual fact, there was papillary muscle and caudal sparing onto the anterior sewing ring. And on the uh, cine imaging, you can appreciate that this anterolateral cords are actually buttressing uh, the bioprosthetic mitral valve leaflets. And owing to ventricular remodeling, this is preventing the mitral valve leaflets from opening. We're now going to see the cine imaging of the short axis, and you can actually appreciate this on the bottom right-hand image, this focal area of caudal insertion onto the interior margin of the sewing ring. We also note some subtle calcification over the superior cusp, which was also restricted. So I think this patient had quite complex anatomy and a quite unusual reason for them to have a bioprosthetic mitral valve obstruction. And it was part in due to the preservation of the caudal material onto the anterior sewing ring, and also the, um, some degenerative changes we can see by the calcification. We're now moving forward to a dedicated transcatheter mitral valve planning package. This is now using Aquarius Terra Recon, their TMVR planning software. And all I'm doing is measuring the internal circumference of the sewing ring, and then I will be virtually implanting a uh, a valve inside this sewing ring as to what we perceive to be the optimal sizing for this valve. And thereafter, we would derive and calculate the neo-left ventricular outflow tract area. Now, for this case, we really wanted to make uh, certain that our interventional cardiologists had all of this complex and high fidelity information available for them at the time of their procedure. So what we decided to do in this case is to not only provide CT fluorofusion, but also CT echo fusion. Now, the first step in, in doing all of this is to do some segmentation on the valve assist platform. And what we've done here is we've segmented out the left atrium, the aorta, the left ventricle, and also the bioprosthetic mitral valve. We then make some planning lines on the CT scan, and in this particular case, we've demarcated the leaflets as one, two, and three on the middle image. We've marked the SVC, IVC, and optimal fossor ovalis, and also have drawn lines where the abnormal caudal insertion points were. Note that over the left atrium on the middle hand image, you can also see just above the little circle of the fossor ovalis, areas of calcification over the left atrium, which would be important for the interventional cardiologist to avoid. Now, once all of this planning has been done, and this usually only takes about three to four minutes, the CT data set is imported into the GE95 CT echo platform. Now, once we've done the GE valve assist uh, and done the segmentation, there's only two further steps that are required to be able to perform CT fluorofusion. And all we need to do is to take two orthogonal views, match up the images, and that causes the co-registration to occur, and we're ready to do the procedure under CT fluoro guidance. Now, for the echo assessment, what we can see here, these are the transesophageal echo images that were performed at the time of the procedure. It's very similar to what we've seen on the echocardiogram. We can see that the mobility of the anterior leaflet is restricted, and there is this abnormal echo-dense uh, material located just superior on the left ventricular aspect of the mitral valve. And this is restricting mitral valve leaflet opening along with some degeneration. Now, this is the echo Doppler view. As you can see, as Julie has mentioned, there is mild to moderate mitral valve regurgitation and also an increased gradient through the mitral valve. On TOE, it was measured 6.1, but this is often lower than on the transthoracic echocardiogram owing to the anesthetic requirements during the procedure. So what we're also now able to do is something called blood speckle imaging. Now, blood speckle imaging is a blood flow visualization technique that overcomes some of the conventional limitations of standard Doppler imaging. Standard Doppler imaging is Doppler angle dependent and also is subject to aliasing problems. Now, when we use blood speckle imaging, as you'll see on the next slide, this uses ultra high frame rates that enables the tracking of blood cells over subsequent frames. 
So as mentioned on the previous slide, this is an example of blood speckle imaging. And we can see two different renditions of blood speckle imaging on this slide. We can see line rendering on the left-hand side and a different prediction on the right-hand side, which is arrow rendering. And both of these images were acquired at zero degrees. Now, this is the 3D echo images, uh, the four-dimensional images using the GE platform. And we can see here on the left-hand side the restriction of the anterior leaflet and also some calcific degeneration of the superior cusp, which was causing a restriction uh, in the valve opening and also the increased mean gradients. On the right-hand image, you can see the color Doppler superimposed on the four-dimensional image. As we've previously seen. Now, for the CT echo fusion, this really is a very simple process. Now, the first step is really to match up the CT images to the little icons that are given to you on the screen. So on the bottom left-hand image, we need to make sure that we have a two-chamber view on the CT image that resembles the little icon on the top right-hand side of the image. Now, once we've derived the same image, what we will then do is to put our marker points, which indicates the anterolateral mitral annulus, the posterior medial mitral annulus, the anterior, posterior, and aortic marker points. Now, the same is then done for the transesophageal echocardiographic images. We need to make sure that our TOE images match the little icons on the screen starting on the bottom left, the top right, and the bottom right. Now, once this is done, that ensures that our co-registration between the echo and the CT will be performed. The only final step is just to ensure the accuracy of the co-registration with a few minor adjustments. And it really is as quick as that. Now, once that procedure has been performed, we now have available for use the CT echo fusion for live use within the procedural case. So as we can see, uh, this is what the CT echo fusion looks like. At the beginning of the case, we would upload the CT data onto the GE95 platform, do the quick fusion, the echo, and the CT co-registration, and that enables the advantages of both imaging modalities at once. We have the wide field of view and the high spatial resolution of the cardiac CT superimposed on the fantastic dynamic imaging and temporal resolution properties of the echocardiogram. And this can be of particular benefit when complicated procedures and complicated anatomy uh, is present in a specific case. Now, another advantage of this particular case is that this patient started to develop some early uh, thrombus within the left atrial appendage, which dissipated after the administration of intravenous heparin. Now, what we were able to do is it can be confusing when you're having to change images very, very rapidly on TOE is to place some marker points that would track the TOE during the procedure. So what we've done here is we've placed a yellow and a red marker point over the left atrial appendage and left superior pulmonary vein. And those marker points remain consistent irrespective of the angle of acquisition of the TOE during the case, which can be a very useful tool for helping navigation during complicated procedures. We use the transesophageal echocardiogram, very similar to the first case that Julie has shown you, to guide the transeptal puncture in an optimal position, because we know that this is important for the procedural case. And also we use the uh, CT fluorofusion to help guide the puncture, which you can see here. We've got our marker points. In the pink line, you see the left atrium. In the yellow, you see the bioprosthetic valve. And we have the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava and the optimal crossing point of the phosphorovalis. What we've also done here is to demarcate the areas of calcification, which we wanted our interventional cardiologist to avoid. Now, we also use the CT echo fusion to help navigate the interventional cardiologist to make sure that they were able to avoid those areas of calcification. And this is where I think the CT echo fusion becomes invaluable in terms of guiding transeptal puncture and also the approach in these types of cases. So we then use the TOE to guide the position across the mitral valve, and we've seen this as in the previous case. We use 2D and both 3D echocardiography to confirm the catheter position. And on the th third video, you can actually see a 4D view of the mitral valve from the left ventricle. And we're able to actually place little marker points so the interventional cardiologist knows what is their catheter and what were the abnormal cords on the ventricular surface of the prosthetic mitral valve. Now, the anterior aspect of the valve was crossed using an agilis sheath under CT transesophageal echo guidance, and a 25 millimeter balloon was inflated to reposition the cord in the first instance. Now, this was successful in reducing the gradient, and this willfully displaced uh, the cord to prevent a trampoline effect if we'd gone directly for a bioprosthetic valve in valve procedure. Now, you can see this happening here on the right hand image. 
Uh, and this is the balloon inflation across a bioprosthetic mitral valve. And bear in mind, we did this first to avoid any caudal tension that could result in a sapien 3 dislodgement if we went direct for this procedure in the first instance. Now, this is what we saw on the valve assist to help guide our procedure. And we see the biplane visualization on the right-hand side. Now, this was the echo assessment post-balloon inflation. We can see that there's some uh, relief of the tension on the cord on the anterior margin of the sewing ring. And this enabled us just to have some confidence about proceeding direct to the valve in valve procedure. Now, the balloon inflation was successful, the gradient reduced, and we did some blood speckle imaging to see what that looked like following the balloon inflation. And we can see this on the right-hand image. So we then uh, proceeded directly to the valve deployment, and we can see this on the CT fluorofusion on the left-hand side. And we can see the procedure itself with the valve deployment inside the biprosthetic mitral valve on the right-hand side. Now, you can see the value of both imaging modalities in providing complementary information in terms of the dynamic information from transesophageal echocardiography to the high-detailed anatomical information that you get with the CT fluorofusion and the wide field of view. So the valve was successfully deployed, which was confirmed by 2D and color Doppler, and the gradient post-op was 2.73 millimeters of mercury. So a fantastic result. Now we did blood speckle imaging before the procedure, during the procedure, and after the procedure, and we were able to demonstrate that these flow vortices improved substantially following the valve deployment and the sequential balloon inflation and direct valve uh, implantation. And 4D imaging was performed to confirm the successful deployment of the device. And as we can see, there was no significant paravalvular regurgitation noted on either the standard 4D imaging or the 4D imaging with color Doppler flow. And on this slide, we can see valve assist, which shows a perfect match between CT and X-rays, the CT fusion showing that this perfect match can also be observed between the CT and echo. And just bear in mind that we use the same pre-planning CT, both on the CT fluorofusion and also the CT echo fusion. So I think to conclude, I think both Julia and I and would both agree that actually some of the fundamental aspects of ensuring good procedural outcomes is the communication between the cardiac structural images and also our interventional colleagues. Now, all of this communication can be made easier using some of these imaging modalities that traverse both the imaging domain and also the structural imaging domain. So in other words, making sure that the information we see in our pre-planning stages is made available for the interventional cardiologists. I believe that we both believe very strongly that making this information available and using these sophisticated features improves procedural outcomes, and it also maximizes all of the hard work that we do uh, before the actual procedure has been performed uh, for the benefit of the patient ultimately. Many thanks. So we have seen two beautiful, uh, fantastic demonstrations on how imaging modalities are here, not only to guide the procedures, but also which type of procedures. Um, let me start by asking uh, Julia first, uh, as an echocardiographer, we know that there are some long courses to learn, to be uh, able to guide the, uh, the hands and the eyes of interventional cardiologist or a surgeon. Because ECHO now is not only about analyzing, making the diagnosis, it's also about guiding which type of procedure, which type of surgery eventually uh, it should and could be done. So what are the gaps today that could make any team in the world who are embracing this percutaneous therapy able to guide the interventions uh, from an echocardiographer point of view? So thank you so much, uh, Thomas. First of all, you're right because uh, we feel that interventional imaging, as we call it now, is uh, the subspecialty of the future. And if you think it's quite applicable in women as well, women in cardiology. So it needs, uh, first of all, a great understanding of 2D echo to start with. And then you move to 3D echo and subsequently a great knowledge of uh, transesophageal echo. But also the magic thing is the continuous uh, collaboration with the interventionalist and the structural people and, of course, the cardiac surgeons 
in order to understand the anatomy and to work together as a team for the best results. So yes, there, there is a learning curve. I strongly believe and I would encourage you know, people that they love um, interventions and imaging to follow this pathway of interventional imaging. It's very exciting. So Julia, is a new specialty born now, uh, uh, an echocardiography interventionalist? Yes, uh, it is uh, like uh, it is almost the future. I know we know few women around the world that they have started the path and, you know, with the knowledge of uh, echo and of course, uh, CT and multimodality imaging CT and MRI is very important. But in order to guide the intraprocedural echo and to do the TOE, that's a, a great uh, way of helping interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. That's good. Uh, Ronak, uh, so you are a radiologist, so we have a video uh, case of uh, uh, Professor Donal uh, that ECHO is coming or meeting a CT scan. Uh, so, but also you master other tools. Uh, is ECHO also meeting Fioro or we should we put all these people together from a radiologist point of view? how to do this? What's the best way to do it? So I can't speak from the perspective of a radiologist because I'm a cardiologist. So <laughs> um, my first wife was echocardiography and then I moved to cardiac CT sort of in uh, 2009, 2010 when I was in the US. But I think that um, structural imaging, as Julia has mentioned, is an emerging speciality and it won't just involve the acquisition of echocardiography skills such as transthoracic and TOE and 3D application of techniques. But there's also going to be a requirement for people to start to use um, cardiac CT and have a good understanding of the structural anatomy. And I think cardiologists are ideally situated uh, in this regards because they understand what the procedural uh, technique is going to be with their interventional cardiologists in the communication. I think beyond echocardiography and beyond cardiac CT, where we will start to see images of the future really take hold of is actually the incorporation of bioengineering and sophisticated imaging techniques and utilizing artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning techniques to improve procedural outcomes. We're already starting to see an emergence of these techniques in some of the cases that we've shown that gone are the days where imaging is seen in isolation. I don't think we nowadays have people who just do echocardiography or people who just do CT. All of the images at Guy's and St. Thomas's and all of those images around the world have an understanding of all of the imaging modalities and their role in planning for specific cases. CT fluorofusion, I think, is a a technique that is absolutely fabulous. Uh, one of the areas where we use CT uh, fluorofusion is certainly for transcaster mitral therapies, particularly with valve in MAC, also valve in bioprosthetic cases, and also cases which have complex anatomy. The echo CT fusion, I think, is an area that needs to be explored further. And I think for some of the reasons that we've mentioned during our talk, that you have the virtues of incorporating the benefits of all of the imaging modalities simultaneously for the interventional cardiologists. You then have the incorporation of holography, you have virtual reality, and all of these things can only make uh, the procedural outcomes better for the future. So I think structural images for the future, interventional cardiologists for the future, will start to use all of these techniques and have a great understanding of anatomy me as newer techniques and uh, computer technology emerges. I mean, this is a fascinating field indeed. And uh, we know that the skills are con 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 constantly evolving. The iterations of devices are also changing from every couple of months, I would say. But all the unmet needs are now focused on imaging. And we know this. I mean, any one of us who practices the mitral or tricuspid, mainly uh, transcatheter treatments, know that the gaps are there and this is where we expect uh, the most. So um, I want to thank you both and Professor Donal also for having been able to gather this type of demonstrations. I want to thank also General Electric uh, to put us all together and uh, to, to share this uh, type of perspectives. This is a jump into the future, but I'm sure that we will have more and more to say. I think everything that should be done within the confine of a hard team. Thank you for attending EuroPCR 2021. Uh, thank you and stay safe, all of you. Take care. Bye-bye.